There are three types of bonds. Ionic bonds are electrostatic attractions caused by the attraction of a positively charged ion and a negatively charged ion. In an ionic bond, one atom, the metal, generally loses an electron, and one atom, the nonmetal, is going to gain an electron. So one atom is gaining and one is losing an electron. So in an ionic bond, an electron is transferred. Looking at this, we have magnesium and we have chlorine. Magnesium has two valence electrons. While chlorine has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven valence electrons. Each of them have seven. So magnesium loses one of its electrons to chlorine. And now chlorine has a full outer shell. But it can't bond with just one chlorine because then magnesium would have a leftover valence electron. And it wants to have either none or eight in its valence electron, valence shell. So then the other electron goes to another chlorine. Now all ions have full outer shells. And we have an ionic bond between one magnesium and two chlorines. Covalent bonds are those where the electrons are going to be shared between atoms. Covalent bonds are going to be between nonmetals. So between two or more nonmetals. An example of a covalent bond is between oxygen and hydrogen. Both of those are nonmetals. Hydrogen has one valence electron while oxygen has six. So they're going to share electrons. And when they share, notice now hydrogen has a full outer shell of two. This one also does. And then oxygen has two four, six, eight in its valence shell. So all atoms now have full outer shells. And the shared pairs of electrons give rise to the covalent bonds that hold the molecule together. Metallic bonds are found in pure metal elements or mixtures of metals. So if I had just copper, copper would be held together with metallic bonds. Mixture of metals are called alloys. Alloates are a solid solution that is comprised of two or more elements, at least one of which is a metal. Some examples of alloys are steel, brass, and pewter. For example, steel is made out of iron and carbon, while brass is made of copper and zinc. And pewter, you may not recognize the name, but that's what you find in gift stores a lot of times. It's that silvery material that they make little figurines out of. That's made out of tin and just lots of other metals. But the main metal is tin and pewter. So give yourself a minute and figure out if these are ionic, covalent, or metallic. Remember that ionic should be between a metal and a nonmetal. Covalent should be between two nonmetals. And metallic will just be a pure metal or an alloy. Restart when you have an answer. The first one you should have gotten was ionic because this is a metal and this is a nonmetal. The next one you should have gotten was ionic because those are held together with ionic bonds. You could have said ionic and covalent because ammonium is held together with covalent bonds and phosphate is held together with covalent bonds. But when they go together, it's going to be an ionic bond because you have positively and negatively charged ions. But the polyatomic ion itself is a covalent bond. So technically we have ionic and covalent. For the next one, dihydrogen pentoxide, you should have said covalent because we have nonmetal, 
and a non-metal. Your next one you should have said was metallic because that's just a metal. As is magnesium. Bronze you should was a should have said was a metal because that's an alloy, which is made up of metals. This one covalent because this is a non-metal. And this is a non-metal. And the last one you should have said was ionic because this one is a metal. This is a polyatomic ion with a negative charge. So again, you could have said ionic and covalent if you knew hydroxide is covalent, but when you mix them together, then it's gonna be ionic because you have charges. So in this unit, you're gonna to have to be able to draw Lewis dot structures for atoms, ions, and compounds. So we've talked about Lewis structures for atoms before, but we'll talk about it again. So it says to draw the Lewis structure for an atom, you only account for the valence electrons because those are the electrons that are involved in bonding. And when you pair them up, you pair them up just as if they would be in the orbital diagrams. So the first two get paired up and then it's one for every side. For instance, if it was some letter X, First two get paired up, and then three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So lithium is in the first column, so it has one valence electron. So it should just have one dot. Boron is located here, and so it's one, two, three valence. So remember to figure out our valence. This column has one, two, Four, five, six, seven, eight. So boron should have three. The first two get paired. The third one goes on any of the sides. Go ahead and try these four on your own. Restart when you have answers. So carbon, you should have said, had four valence. Two paired, two unpaired. If yours look like that, then that's fine. Or like that. But they should not be paired and paired. Oxygen, you should have said had six valence. So two paired and two unpaired. Bismuth, you should have said had five. So two paired, three unpaired. And arsenic also has five, so it should look the same as bismuth. Metals tend to lose electrons to form positively charged cations. To draw a Lewis structure for a cation, you're gonna remove the same number of electrons as the charge, and then make sure you put a charge on the Lewis structure. calcium starts with two valence electrons. But we know that calcium is going to get a plus two charge. And so to get that plus two charge, we're going to have to lose two electrons. Therefore, calcium ions Lewis dot structure is only calcium with a plus two charge. Sodium starts with one and it should have a plus one charge. Therefore, it loses its electron and it's just sodium with a plus charge. Nonmetals gain electrons to form negatively charged anions. So to draw Lewis structures with gained electrons, we're gonna go ahead and put X's to distinguish them and make sure that we put the charge on the Lewis structure. Some textbooks just have you add them as dots, so it doesn't really matter. We're just going to add them as X's so we can tell the difference. So nitrogen starts with five valence electrons, but it has a negative three charge, which means it should gain three. So it started with five, and then we're going to gain one, 
two, three. So notice my negative ion now has a full outer shell of eight valence electrons. Go ahead and try sulfide ion on your own. Restart when you have an answer. In sulfur, you should have started with six valence. And then it makes a negative two charge, so we're going to gain two more. Gain one, gain two, and we have eight valence. 98% of the time, your negative ions should have eight electrons around them, whether it be eight dots or a mixture of dots and X's and a negative charge, while your positive ions will have no dots and whatever charge that ion makes. So we don't generally have just positive and negative ions. They go together to make ionic compounds because if something's losing an electron, something else has to be gaining that electron. So to draw the Lewis structure for an ionic compound, first you draw the Lewis structure for the positive ion. Make sure that you show that charge. If there's more than one positive ion, be sure to draw all of them with their charges. Then draw the Lewis structure for the negative ion, again with charge close by. If there's more than one negative ion, make sure you draw all of them with their charges. So the first step wasn't written there. And that's, I need to write my formula. So sodium chloride. Sodium is a plus one charge, and that's A. Chloride is a negative one charge, and that's Cl negative. So look, remembering my naming, that's going to be just NaCl. So I should have one sodium and one chlorine. Sodium started with one electron. And chlorine is going to start with seven. So what's happening is sodium is going to lose an electron to chlorine. So sodium just has a plus charge. And then my chlorine should have seven dots. And an X for my gained electron and then a negative one charge. When I put the negative ion in brackets, just so you know that the dots and X's went with chlorine and not with sodium. And then the charge goes on the outside of the brackets. So my final answer is this. You do not have to write this reaction over on the left hand side unless you want to help you visualize it. So lithium nitride. Again, we're going to do this one together. Lithium has a plus one charge. Nitride is nitrogen with a negative three charge. So your formula should be Li3N. So looking at that formula, I need three lithium. And each lithium starts with one valence. that reacts with one nitrogen with five valence electrons. And then notice one lithium electron goes there, one there, and one there to fill up nitrogen. If we didn't have three lithium, then nitrogen wouldn't have eight valence electrons. And that's the whole reason that they're bonding. So to draw this, I have my three lithium and my one nitrogen. And nitrogen should have a negative three charge. Go ahead and try magnesium fluoride on your own. Restart when you're done with just magnesium fluoride. So your final answer for magnesium fluoride should be what's written there. Magnesium should have no dots and a plus two charge. And you should have two fluorines, each fluorine with seven dots and one X. Doesn't matter where your X is as long as it's around fluorine and you have seven dots. And each fluorine should have a negative one charge because negative one and negative one is negative two, which cancels out with a positive two. I'm going to pause the video and do aluminum oxide on your own. Restart when you have an answer.
this is the final answer for aluminum oxide. So your formula is Al2O3. So we needed two aluminums with a plus three charge. And we needed three oxygens, each with negative two charges. Each of the oxygens having six valence electrons that they came in with and two X's showing that they gained two electrons each. Finally, the characteristics of ionic compounds are they have high melting and boiling points, they exist as crystals and are therefore brittle and will cleave when struck, so they'll break apart when you hit them. Many are soluble, soluble meaning will dissolve in water, and many of them will conduct electric current in their molten and their dissolved forms. They'll conduct electricity in their molten, which means liquid, and their dissolved forms. Very important to note, not in solid. Because in solid form, those charges are locked and it's not able to conduct an electric current. Only when it's liquid or dissolved can those ions move, allowing it to conduct electricity.